Good morning. It's uh, 9.01 a.m. on January 1, 2013. Happy New Year. Uh, it's got to be better than last year. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> truly, it's going to be a lot worse in many regards, but uh, uh, personally, I've done a lot of suffering, and I'm going to change my attitude and uh, treat it all as uh, a big burden that I'll eat away at until it's all gone this year. So 2013 is going to be okay. Anyway, this is a uh, Wujo on the uh, little bloop theory, uh, chakras and mudras, uh, but it's also a test of our ability to host uh, on our new servers uh, the Wujos as well as the other audios and work out some glitches. So we're doing this today just to test everything, but also to wrap up the talk on the chakras and then... Um, uh, fill in some gaps on the little bloop theory as it relates to space, gravity, and time. Uh, we'll finish the, the chakra business here first. I've only gone as high as the throat chakra, so I can't speak of impersonal knowledge of the um, uh, third eye chakra or the crown chakra. Uh, that's the thousand petal lotus that uh, opens up. Uh, a couple of things to note about them. Uh, the chakras from the uh, Mula Dahara, which goes at the uh, base of the spine at the sacrum and tilts slightly. Um, uh, tilts slightly on the outside of the body and actually is what connects you to the yin energy of the earth. It's really interesting. I mean, when you look at the humans from the perspective of the chakras, we are creatures that have these tendrils that basically come out of our tailbone area, the sacrum. Uh, that triangular shaped bone with all those nice little holes that has these interesting dimensions. Should everybody, anybody ever want to get into sacred geometry, check out the dimensions of the, sacri the sacrum. But in any event, uh, from that perspective, we have these uh, tendrils that go out from there, reach down to the, to the ground. If you eliminate our skin body and all of our flesh body and just dealt with this as our energy body the, and the chakras, then you would see that that is our support to the ground. And uh, we have a similar plate. Uh, the chakras are like giant petals. Let's stop for a second and describe them real quick. They're like giant petals. They spin, uh, uh, giant flower um, uh, flowers. And they're composed of multiple petals. The Muladhara has four. It spins slowly. Uh, it's in my experience, and I'm speaking from personal experience, that as you rise up through the chakras, they spin faster as you go higher. And there are more petals in each of the arrangements of the chakra as you progress upward. And you go through the Muladhara all the way up through to the um, crown chakra, and there's seven of them. These correspond to the three Dandian of the... Um, uh, Taoist, the Chinese understanding. This, uh, the chakras are basically a, a Hindu understanding or a yogic understanding because yoga spans the Hindu um, uh, religion and, and is larger than that. Um, so anyway, these, these chakras uh, have various different arrangements of numbers of petals in them and there's a slight concavity at the center of them. That actually, by the way, the concavity is where you go in your meditative state to cross into the stream. Do not do this unless you know what the hell you're doing. It's very scary and you can find yourself lost. If you don't know how to leave a trail of crumbs to get back, there's all different kinds of, uh, let's use a word that doesn't really apply. Let's call it material fluff that can cause you issues. There's also other beings on the stream because bear in mind you're going through your own chakra at that point, through the null point, the zero point that does not spin and you're entering into the other side, and it's very much like the uh, time tunnel kind of things they show you on TV uh, where you zip through. Now, uh, with one exception, all of the chakras have more uh, pedals as you climb up, and they spin faster. And I'm up at the, uh, the fifth chakra, which is the throat chakra, and it tilts slightly. Oh, let, us, let me stop for a second and go back to the... Um, uh, the third chakra, the uh, Manapura, that's the one that's in your solar plexus. And it's where the uh, Maladahara is um, uh, tilted uh, downward slightly and has tendrils that go on out into the earth. Uh, the Manapura is, uh, is like basically horizontal uh, to your spine. It's parallel to your spine. It sticks out somewhat from your body ever so slightly. It's more or less around what is known as the Hara, which is an inch or so below your navel. Uh, two fingers usually, uh, the knuckles of your first two fingers usually defines that. 
this chakra uh, sits out flat relative to you, and it has tendrils that can reach out and go out. And these tendrils, they go out into the things of the earth, other beings, if you will. And so from that perspective, we have tendrils that then go out, uh, tendrils of energy. They're not physical or pseudopodia or anything. They're energetic tendrils that go on out and connect us to all of reality. And so from that viewpoint, uh, with our body removed, the tubular body, the skin body, the muscle body, the, the bone body, and we're left with the energy body, and the fluid body, we see this interchange in the fluids of the body with the energy, and that's how the energy comes from the chakra system into the fluids first, because it's less dense. Actually, into the gases that are dissolved in the fluids, because those are the less, least dense, then into the fluids, then into the more dense as you go on. This is why it takes longer to recycle the bone material in your body than it does, say, your brain material or your, your skin material, these kind of things. And these are all recycled continuously, which we can get to in a minute when we actually talk about the little bloop. Uh, so the, the chakra, uh, the Manapura chakra that's just out there, is very much akin to the description that was given by oh, that, that Indian uh, shaman, uh, Don Carlos. Uh, no, Don Juan Carlos. Don Juan Carlos? Don Juan. Uh, one of these guys. Uh, anyway, in, in Carlos Castaneda's books, uh, is Don Juan. And uh, he was a skilled uh, Manapura tendril uh, user and could theoretically hold himself up with these energy tendrils, which he could control at will. And uh, I've read of examples, and I've known one guy who had some skill with it. He wasn't really skilled. He couldn't hold himself up, but he could move things uh, with these tendrils out from his body. So if there was like a chair or something in front of him, he could come along and without physically touching it, it was a couple of inches away. Uh, as long as he was aligned with the Manapura, um, tendrils, he could like sort of bunch them up or something, I don't know the mechanism, and cause the chair to bump out of the way slightly. I, it was an interesting effect. Uh, obviously, he's much more skilled uh, now if he's um, uh, still been pursuing it. This is a number of years back. but um, So these kind of things do indeed uh, present themselves from the, the chakras, but that's not what they're there for. The chakras spin. And uh, as I was saying, with one exception, uh, Ajna, the, the flame chakra, the, the sixth chakra at the pineal gland that I'm facing now, with that one exception, they all gain pedals as you climb upwards within the system. And they also gain speed as, they, um, as you go up. So if you can see your chakras spin, usually it starts out, I guess, with a muladhara, and so it's the slow spin that you just get real used to. Then as you climb on up, you see that the rate of spin can change. And it depends on whichever chakra you put your consciousness in as to the rate of spin you're experiencing at that particular point. And also, the, each one of these present perhaps a different level. I haven't investigated that because I've been busy as a, a toad on a hot plate here uh, this whole last year. Uh, but they may present different avenues, if you will, into uh, the non-material uh, part of reality, the other side of materium. In other words, the stream may be different depending on which chakra you go through. But the, uh, the Ajna chakra, the one I'm facing now at the um, third eye, that only has two uh, petals. Why this should be, I don't know. Its, is its issues with spin are different. Its shape is different. Uh, it presents many different characteristics than any of the others that I've climbed up through. And uh, at some point, I, I'll broach this and be able to determine a little bit more. I'm starting to use some of the techniques that I'll discuss in a half a second uh, uh, to uh, examine some of these uh, differences, I mean, uh, between the uh, Ajna and the next one down, which, which is the uh, Vishuddhi. That's the, um, uh, the throat, throat chakra, which is at an interesting angle. That was uh, unexpected. It's actually at an angle referring, uh, relative to the uh, um, back side of your jaw, uh, which is, uh, was unexpected. I fell into it uh, from one, jumped up from the one below, the heart chakra, and into the throat chakra, and it's like, wow, hey, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, this is an odd little angle to get into, and I haven't really uh, examined that much yet. But um, anyway, so the chakras are all the way up to the crown chakras. With that one exception, they gain petals, and after you get through the uh, Ajna and you get to the crown or the Brahma or uh, uh, Sarahar excuse me, Sahasra Ra Chakra, the Brahman Chakra, that's the thousand petal lotus because it's got so many petals and it spins so fast. Uh, apparently it's an amazing experience when you get there. Uh, but they're all um, opalescent or pearlescent 
uh, when you are, quote, visualizing them, when you're in them. And it's very much a visual experience. Uh, I'm not um, being facetious at that at all. There's no illusion about this visual experience. It is every bit as visual and as uh, tactile in that sense with your eyes, sensing, touching with your eyes, as any visual experience you're going to have in the materium. And it's quite an oddity in that regard. So um, uh, you can tell, for instance, uh, when someone's actually experienced this because their language about it is just so plain, and it's always usually uh, tinged with a bit of wonder and awe because it's it's just it's really freaky. <laughs> you just don't know what's going on when you first have it happen, and then to to live with it for a number of years and explore it uh, is an interesting uh, process. So anyway, uh, um, I, I'm stuck pushing this um, Ajna. Chakra, and so I started investigating some of the techniques that I can use to get up to it, um, and I, that's why I've been following and, and getting involved with the mudras. There's some mudras that you can use with your tongue. Now, I had not brought this up before. A lot of people, uh, when I discuss my meditation uh, techniques and uh, wujo some time back, said, oh, well, you left one out, which is the tongue at the... Uh, intersection of the soft and the hard palate at the roof of the mouth. And no, I did not leave it out. I just didn't want to discuss it because it's a real dangerous one unless you're really prepared to live with the consequences because that's not really it. There's threefold component to that, um, that mudra. And it's position, and then it's pressure, and then it's direction. And so that mudra is, is quite specific, and, it, and it's threefold, and it's um, bifurcated. There's two halves to that. So there's actually the three components doubled. And it's very difficult to live with the results of it if you're unprepared. If you don't have your muldahara chakra moving, you shouldn't be messing with that mudra. And I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can look it up and experiment for yourself if you want, if you, if you really want to get into the danger of it all, because of the things that that particular mudra does relative to your pineal gland uh, through the parathyroid system and the parasympathetic, or what we know as the autotomic nervous system. Uh, so you've got to be real careful with it because you can really screw yourself up. We have to note something here, that meditation is not without its risks. Or the, let me just put it this way, meditation in general is, is reasonably safe, but the path to enlightenment is not without its risks. And if you read some of the uh, literature in the original Chinese, which frequently is mistranslated in modern day English, why that should be, I don't know. Probably the subject of its own wujo. But if you read some of the original Chinese of the 5th century uh, Taoist, who were it's really, I would think, um, admittedly, by most of the people that study him, that was the, the peak of the intellectual thought. Uh, in any way, the 5th century, there they discussed the 10,000 martyrs. And it was not a, or the 10,000 lost. Uh, you'll see it referenced many different ways, but usually it's 10,000. And it's actually more than that, but that number was just chosen to represent 10,000 people that have gone before and died in the process of searching for these various techniques that are passed down. And thus we find the need for the um, guru, disciple, or mentor, uh, student uh, uh, path, because usually the mentor is standing there before you and uh, or guru and if they know what the hell they're doing a they've done it themselves and they've survived so they've probably got a few clues whereas um uh you know just reading about it this is why it's often said that you shouldn't proceed on these paths just reading the words of dead people because their uh words don't usually come with the cautions relative or specific to your situation and it is dangerous i know this uh, to be true uh, so uh, exploring these things is not uh, without its risk. Go there knowing that as an adult, uh, knowing that you can screw yourself up for, and here's the thing, guys, you can screw yourself up beyond this life in the sense that if you don't know what you're doing and you proceed incautiously, some of the risks can carry over to multiple lifetimes. So the penalties are much heavier than merely death. That's just the gateway to the penalty, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. And this was quite clearly expressed in a lot of the writings of the 5th century Taoists, uh, some of the, which I've had the privilege to read uh, with a, um, a very knowledgeable Chinese fellow on, uh, at my side. So uh, we got a really good understanding of what was being said. 
and uh, what was being involved. Uh, so be careful with these mudras. Now this brings up, so actually let me explain that there are mudras with the hands, there's mudras with the feet, there's mudras with the body, uh, there's mudras with the tongue. Uh, there are mudras with the eyes, although they're limited, and their effectiveness is only rarely demonstrated in this plane, I think, in the last few centuries, the materium. 